Good afternoon. Welcome to this panel discussion on nuclear risk reduction in the Baltic Sea region, which is jointly hosted by the Centre for Geopolitics and the Centre for the Study of Existential Risk at the University of Cambridge, with support from the European Leadership Network. This is the first collaboration between these two centres, and we hope it will be followed by further online and in-person events. We've had a lot of interest, and I'm delighted to say that with our colleagues in the network of universities in the Baltic region, we now have a substantial programme of events and activities and a regular newsletter. If you're watching this and you haven't yet done so, please sign up to receive both centres regular material, which you can find on our websites. About 80 people have registered for this event, which we're very happy with, and we look forward to a good conversation. It's an online video panel, which will end at 4.30 UK time promptly. I will moderate a discussion with the panelists for the first half hour, and then in the second half, I'll relay questions from you, the audience, to our panelists. You as the audience will be able to see and hear me and the panelists. You will have your microphone and camera switched off automatically, so at no time will you be heard or seen by anyone in this webinar. However, you're still able to communicate with me and the panelists. At the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A option. Click on it, and when it opens, you have the chance to type questions. If you do type questions, please start by writing your name and your affiliation first. If your question's for a specific panelist, please state that at the outset as well. I will try to cover as many of your questions as possible, though in view of our numbers and time constraints, it's possible we won't get to everyone. Finally, I also need to let you know that this video panel is being recorded and we will post the recording on our websites over the next few days for anybody who can't join us here to be able to see us. The background is very straightforward. Vladimir Putin's decision to install nuclear weapons in Belarus follows threats about the use of nuclear weapons from Kaliningrad, Russia's territory in the Baltic. The war in Ukraine has raised the salience of these threats and has blown away any doubts that European security is under severe strain. Though the main focus of the Russian uh, government remains their war in Ukraine, the risk of conflict in the Baltic Sea region remains very much alive. These threats explain the significant increases in defence spending in many European states and the radical shift in public and government alignment, which has led to the path of both Finland and Sweden to formal NATO membership. The recent summit of NATO in Vilnius highlighted many of these issues. In these circumstances, nuclear risk reduction has become an important topic of debate, but there is a lack of clarity about how this could best be addressed. Proposals to reduce nuclear risks fit, fit broadly into three areas. Military nuclear force posture and capabilities, military nuclear doctrine intention, and communication and relationships understanding. All are important, and ideas might range from hardened lines of reliable communication to restraint in deployments, including, for example, a Baltic nuclear weapon-free zone. But one indisputable element is the need for better communication links and understanding, both between allies and with adversaries. The uncertainties caused by both political realignments and emerging disruptive technologies such as AI and cyber, have uncertain and potentially revolutionary impacts. Our panel of experts is going to consider prevalent attitudes in Northern Europe to nuclear risk reduction in the context of the Ukraine war and reactions across Europe, government's management of the changing balance between facing down Russian aggression and nuclear risk reduction, differing elements of nuclear risk reduction and their relationship with nuclear deterrence, and prospects for developments and realistic arenas and approaches for negotiation. This discussion panel will begin the process of gathering proposals in these fields and assessing them on the basis of their utility and realistic political, strategic and diplomatic prospects. This is particularly pertinent for policy discussions in NATO at present, and we hope to follow up this online panel with an in-person seminar in the autumn. Uh, my name is Charles Clark. I used to be Home Secretary in the UK government. I'm the co-leader of the Baltic Geopolitical Programme, and I'm going to moderate this discussion. 
Our panel is Dr. Marion Mesmer, uh, Artix Pabrix, and Paul Ingram. Uh, they're going to go in that order, and I'll introduce them as we go through one by one. Each panelist will talk for about 10 minutes, and then after that, we hope to have about an hour of discussion where uh, questions come in from you, the audience. Dr. Marion Mesmer is a senior research fellow in the International Security Programme at the Chatham House Institute in London. She has expertise in arms control, nuclear weapons policy issues, and Russia-NATO relations. Before joining Chatham House, Marion was the co-director of BASIC, where she led on the organization's nuclear risk reduction and disarmament work. She's an N2 Innovation Fellow and an Acona Fellow and holds a PhD in security studies from King's College London. Marion, we very much look forward to hearing you this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Charles. I'm really looking forward to being on this panel. And um, I think it's it's very prescient um, to put together a panel on risk reduction in the Baltics at this point in time, uh, because I think we will see much more attention um, on the Baltic Sea region over the next few years. In, in part, uh, I think that is because the political geography of the Baltic Sea region has changed significantly in the last 30 years. I think that change has been fairly easy to overlook if you were situated in Western Europe or certainly if you were situated in the UK. Um, because from, from that perspective, um, lots of the changes have primarily seemed, seemed positive or beneficial. Uh, but um, I... If I had to guess, I would say that from the Russian perspective, a lot of these changes have not looked so positive, which um, which, of course, given what we're seeing um, happening right now with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, then poses a risk for further escalation in the region. So if we if we look at um, what the Baltic Sea region has looked like in 1990, for example, um, at that point in time, only Denmark and Germany were NATO members. Germany was in the process of, of uh, being reunified, um, and therefore the unified Germany um, became a NATO member. And um, Poland was still undergoing democratic transition. Poland didn't become a NATO member until 1999. Um, Lithuania declared independence in 1990, became a NATO member in 2004. Latvia became independent in 1991, and then followed uh, becoming a NATO member in 2004. And Estonia became independent in 1993 and also joined NATO in 2004. So what we can what we can already see there is that um, for most of the 1990s, um, even though Russia at the time controlled a lot less of the Baltic Sea and Baltic territory than the Soviet Union did, um, the Baltic Sea region was fairly fragmented in terms of um, in terms of the the states that make up the Baltic Sea border. Um, it was a fairly loose group of states, all of whom were grappling with their own challenges at the time. The early 90s were also a time of, um, of really bad economic challenges in the region. So um, in terms of security activity, uh, I don't think anyone was too concerned about what might come from the region. A lot of this changed since 1999. So in the last 20 years, what we've seen is that more and more states in the region have become NATO members. That's obviously great for NATO collective security and, and great from a UK perspective. But as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, if you are the Russian government assessing your threat environment, then um, having decreased sea access to Kaliningrad and um, decreased uh, potentially more difficult access to the St. Petersburg seaport, that's looking less promising. Um, once Sweden becomes a full member of NATO, then the whole Baltic region will consist of NATO member states, with the exception of Russia. So um, while this is strategically good for NATO, um, it raises a lot of questions about how we can manage escalation concerns that could arise from the Baltic Sea region in the future. Um, where would nuclear risks come from in the region and how could we de-escalate them? In my view, the risks that would come um, would stem primarily from escalation uh, of low level conflicts. So what we know is that Russia has been active in the below conflict activity in the Baltic Sea region, both in terms of cyber attacks, as well as in terms of um, airspace and maritime border infringements. 
this has been pretty much a constant pain for all border states and um, and has roughly started around 2004. Um, but what we have seen since 2004 is an intensification of such activities. Um, and there has been a further intensification since Russia invaded Crimea in 2014. So what we can see in sort of um, decade jumps is more and more activity, uh, whether that's, you know, on cyber borders, if you can say that cyberspace has borders, or air borders or maritime borders. Um, the, the good news is that um, several of the Baltic states have already put uh, a huge amount of effort into becoming resilient to these threats. Um, and, uh, and the states in the region generally are very aware of the Russian threat. So that's not news for them at all. Um, Finland and Sweden, for example, have a long and close history of military collaboration and, uh, and also work very closely with, um, with their Baltic state neighbors as well. Um, and um, that means that in terms of the resilience of the region, there's already a, a really strong foundation that we can build on. So in terms of risk reduction options, um, where, where do the risks come from? How can we counter them? So one big risk that I see is a risk stemming from Russian behavior, uh, for example, stemming from cyber attacks, stemming from border infringements, stemming from disinformation campaigns. Um, as I just mentioned, a lot of investment has already happened in resilience and in sharing best practice. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that. And I think that's the right course of action. Um, several states in the region have built up really exemplary knowledge when it comes to cybersecurity, when it comes to airspace policing, um, and they are already invested in learning from each other. Estonia, for example, is a leader in the field, as is Finland, um, and we've got the hybrid center of excellence um, for cybersecurity in, in Helsinki. Then another area in which I think we, we can expect risks to stem from is um, is the area of incidents at sea, which might be misinterpreted. I see a particular uh, possibility for that as Russia gets more nervous about sea access to Kaliningrad and to St. Petersburg. We've already seen over the last decade that um, Russia sometimes favors doing um, maritime maneuvers that can increase risks. And um, we will need to learn how to work with that and how to counter that. One instrument that we've got that actually has a long history and that actually stems from the Cold War is um, the Incidents at Sea Agreement, um, also called INCSI. Uh, these tend to be bilateral agreements. Russia um, has several of them with several different NATO member states, um, in total 12 of them. But when we specifically look at the, um, the states around the Baltic Sea, only Germany has an incidence at sea agreement with Russia, which dates back to 1988. So what I would suggest uh, we could do in terms of um, INCSI agreements is, first of all, expand the number of states that have INCSI agreements with Russia, and secondly, update their content. Because if you look at maritime capabilities, 1988 was a long time ago, and naval capabilities have changed significantly since then. So uh, we may want to also make sure that modern capabilities are reflected in those agreements. Um, one question that always comes up in regard to agreements with Russia is how seriously can we take them? Are they still going to be taken seriously? Is Russia a reliable partner? I think the invasion of Ukraine has obviously raised very serious questions about that. And I think we can't answer that for sure. I think that also really stands in the way of being able to reach new agreements with Russia. However, what we can say is that um, up until the invasion of Ukraine, Russia has actually taken the INCSI agreements that existed much more seriously than other types of arms control agreements. So potentially as a risk reduction tool, um, they could still have utility. But that said, I think the biggest challenge we're going to face is um, figuring out whether there is a government uh, in the Kremlin with whom we could reach such agreements. Then there is, um, there is a similar risk reduction tool to the INCSIS, um, which covers other types of escalation. Um, and that's called the Agreements on Preventing Dangerous Military Activities, also called DMAs. Um, there are four NATO member states that currently have DMAs with Russia, uh, but not 
a single Baltic Sea state has them. So similarly to INCSIS, um, they are fairly old agreements dating back to the Cold War. Um, but again, the four agreements that Russia did have um, were still taken seriously up until the invasion of Ukraine. So again, they could potentially provide um, a tool or a template for something that we might want to look at for the uh, Baltic Sea region. And then a particular example of um, Finnish-Russian cooperation that could also potentially be expanded to other um, states that, that share a border with Russia is the Finnish-Russian border working group. Um, it's a really good example of border management cooperation, and it has provided good working level contact for many years. Um, but the main downside of that is that it is not designed to work in a crisis. So if we are particularly concerned about crisis management and um, crisis de-escalation, then we may want to look at how that could be updated in order to work as well in those environments. Um, to conclude, I think, uh, and you know, if you if you were looking at where I originate these risks, the main problem we've got, of course, is that all of these risks uh, stem from Russian escalatory activity, um, and there's only so much we can do in order to control that. And um, I think the 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 main way how we can respond to that is by ensuring that resilience is high, because if you are in a situation where um, signals are misunderstood and you end up in an escalation spiral, um, a, a lot of risk comes from the fact that resilience may be low. So if we can ensure that um, our collective resilience and the resilience of each of the states in the Baltic Sea region is as high as possible for the amount of disruption that they might face, then I think that gives us a really good foundation in order to be able to respond to any of these risks with a clear head. And with that, I stop and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. I muted myself. Apologies for that. Marion, thank you very much indeed. That was tremendous. A very interesting description uh, about the current situation. Of course, the point that you raised about how does one deal with the current Russian government and where does trust exist or not it will be an important theme of our session this evening and this afternoon. Thank you very much indeed. Our second panellist um, is a very distinguished um, Baltic politician. He's currently director of the Northern European Policy Centre and uh, was previously Minister of Foreign Affairs of Latvia from 2004 to 2007, just after that point which Marion just described, and then very recently Minister of Defence of Latvia 2019 to 2022. So he's been very closely involved in these kind of conversations. Uh, in his past before that, after completing his mandatory two-year stint in the Soviet Army, and I think that you're the only panelist artist who's had a mandatory two-year stint in the Soviet Army, he got a degree in history from the University of Latvia uh, and in 1992, and then completed his PhD in political science from the University of Aarhus in Denmark in 1996. He finished his PhD on minorities in Europe and then became rector of the Witzame Institute of Applied Sciences. He's co-authored a book, Latvia Challenge of Change, which was subsequently republished together with volumes on Lithuania and Estonia under the title The Baltic States, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania in 2002. Artists, were absolutely delighted uh, that you join us with your finger very much on the pulse of current uh, Baltic politics and very much look forward to hearing what you have to say. Artist Pabriks. Thank you very much for this introduction, and it is um, really my pleasure to speak on this panel, and I hope that all the listeners will find uh, at least something valuable also uh, from what I will uh, say immediately. Well, first of all, um, I think I probably have to touch upon um, the subject of, of this discussion from the uh, security perspective, history perspective, and political perspective. And also, uh, probably there should be um, approach which is more about conventional forces and then to touch upon also the nuclear part. Now, um, if I'm looking to history, and if I have to refer uh, to the previous speaker, yes, the changes in the Baltic Sea area 
actually in the last years have been quite dramatic and quite important for such country as Latvia or for all three Baltic states. And I even would say for every um, Baltic Sea nation. Why? Because um, if we have to look to this issue from probably two perspectives, from the perspective of Russia and from the perspective of the rest or the from from perspective of the West where we belong to. Uh, if you look from the perspective of Russia, then probably uh, they are now uh, feeling that after Swedish and Finnish uh, accession uh, to NATO, uh, where the main reason actually for this accession, we have to look into the Kremlin aggressive policies against its neighbors, Russia uh, really lost the control of the Baltic Sea. Because in general, they have now two access positions, which is former Königsberg, which is Kaliningrad, uh, between Lithuania and Poland. And uh, another accession point is uh, St. Petersburg, uh, which actually goes uh, through the Finnish Strait between Finland and Estonia. From that perspective, uh, I think that uh, the dominance which was uh, in many ways created after as Russian Empire claimed after, after um, uh, Peter the Great was cutting the window to the Baltic Sea, uh, that dominance of Russian Empire and successfully of the, of the, of the um, Soviet Union is actually curtailed quite, far, uh, quite dramatically after the membership of Sweden and Finland. Now, it's very clear that from the Western perspective, from the Baltic perspective, um, uh, that means the consolidation of attempts to secure that Baltic Sea stays open for each and every nation for navigation, and it, it is not anymore controlled by the aggressive policies and aggressive nature, uh, which stems from the Russian side at this moment. And I would say that from per security perspective, these changes are highly important because before uh, um, Sweden and Finland joined NATO, actually uh, in all the security plans of NATO and, and um, in general in our national plans also, it would be quite difficult to find the way how we could immediately grant uh, the indivisibility uh, of uh, Baltic nations from one side with the rest of European Union and NATO nations from another side. In, um, uh, in simple words speaking, uh, after Finland and Sweden joined NATO, Russia cannot cut Baltic states anymore away from the rest of the West. And that is highly important for us because that gives us additional security. Uh, looking from our perspective to Russian claims that that might decrease or somehow endanger the Russian situation in the Baltic Sea. We have to remind again that uh, as far as conventional forces, the Russians are much stronger and were much stronger represented in the region and the Baltic countries uh, for decades have not been actually balancing their powers against those forces uh, of Russian conventional forces stationed either in former Königsberg or in Pskov region or also in Belarus at, at this moment. So basically looking from the conventional perspective, we were always overwhelmed. And if we do not have these guarantees um, of um, uh, cutting the access deniability with the, with the West, that basically meant that the Baltic countries could be invaded overwhelmed and then the only perspective would be um, would be simply to reconquer or to uh, liberate against the Baltic countries from possible Russian aggression. Now uh, what could uh, keep the Russian invasion away actually here we come to the nuclear part because until we do have actually the balance of nuclear powers between United States first of all and Russia, uh, such an attack on Baltic states might cause, in general, a war between NATO and Russia. Uh, but at the same time, uh, that also would give a balance 
that Russians would understand that there is a seriousness uh, on the Western side to defend the Baltics or to defend the Poland. And um, from that perspective, the Baltic countries always politically have been supporting on the one hand, of course, reduction of nuclear risks. But this reduction should not come on the expense of reduction conventional forces even more on the Western side, because we already have been under um, uh, represented. And also the reduction of nuclear forces should not mean that, for instance, United States or the Western countries like uh, United Kingdom or France is reducing something, but uh, the Russia is not doing this. And uh, it's also about um, the latest decade where um, there are certain assessments among the experts that uh, while um, US, for instance, were kind of uh, uh, not giving any more so much attention to renovation of the nuclear forces. The Russia was doing quite a bit actually to increase its reliance on nuclear forces. And that basically um, endangers this already very fragile balance. So to try to be short, uh, what is happening now and what we think strategically about the security in the Baltic Sea region. First of all, uh, the Ukrainian war and the necessity for uh, the West to supply maximum weapons and to turn the Western economies into the war economies to supply Ukraine with weapons is essential and fundamental for our security in the Baltic Sea region, also for security of such countries as Poland, uh, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, and even Germany. Uh, because if Ukraine loses the war, uh, then um, the possibility that Russia might have some kind of uh, um, acceleration of conflict in the Baltic Sea area is growing. On the other hand, if Russia loses, that means also that they lose the capabilities. So we believe that this fragmented situation uh, in the Baltic area decreased, which means we are becoming more united. We can assist each other in the Baltic uh, countries area, looking from Sweden, from Finland or Poland. And at the same time, the capabilities of Russian conventional forces would be decreased uh, because of this war. That gives us a time. As far as psychology in Moscow and Krem Kremlin, our assessments are, and I believe that it will be very difficult for us to change this assessment, we don't see any grounds for that, is that uh, even if Russians will lose a war, uh, the certain aggressiveness, psychological aggressiveness, political aggressiveness, um, uh, regardless of changes of uh, government in uh, Kremlin, they will stay. That means that uh, in the Baltic Sea area, we would have to remain alert. Uh, regarding the Russia, and we uh, will uh, try to do as much as we can to keep also those limited allied forces, which now after Madrid and Vilnius summit is agreed that each Baltic country, for instance, um, um, uh, is assisted with one brigade from allied forces and not, also not immediately, but 2026, 27. So that takes time to build up because uh, the West actually were disarming while Russia was arming. So that should stay in our view permanently, at least for the next decade, because the next decade will be still under the light or star of, of certain Russia, Russian aggressiveness. As far as the nuclear weapons, Let's say we are ready to encourage any kinds of, of uh, disarmament, but again, it should not uh, decrease the capabilities of West to respond. Secondly, there is also a difference between strategic weapons, of course, and tactical weapons. As far as tactical weapons, they are very close to our borders in Belarus and also in, in, in Kaliningrad. Uh, we do not see that uh, this is a particular threat, psychological threat to the Baltic countries, because in some way, we are used to this, but we think that um, the placement of these weapons, tactical weapons in, in Belarus and, and existence in, in, in Kaliningrad is mainly meant to influence also um, uh, the position 
uh, of the West if such a diplomatic talks will come, and also to extend the pressure on Western societies, which actually, in our view, are re less resilient and uh, more kind of ready to give in to the uh, aggressive uh, Russian diplomatic pressure. And here I come to some kind also another psychological point where we think that um, once it comes to negotiations, and as previous speaker already noted, uh, with Russia, uh, there is uh, at this moment quite high probability uh, that uh, there is not a mutual trust between Russian negotiators and the Western negotiators. And knowing how Russians behave, for instance, uh, remembering also the attempts of uh, Clinton government to have a reset with Russia, which actually at the end was a great failure, which simply um, um, ended up with, with decrees uh, of, of American presence in Europe. We are kind of a little bit, um, I would not say a skeptical, but a little bit fearing that if such a negotiations will start, that Russians will try to find a way uh, simply to take a, upper hand in such a diplomatic negotiations, because Russians always would have a claim. And what could they claim as far as the Baltic Sea? Of course, one of their first claims would be to decrease the NATO presence of conventional weapons in the Baltic Sea area. And this is a no-go uh, for us especially in the Baltic countries, because that would mean that uh, NATO will not be able to implement that policy, what they were claiming to stand for in Madrid and in Vilnius, which means to defend uh, the every inch and every centimeter and every meter of the Baltic soil, uh, if such a conflict will start, because simply there will not be enough of conventional forces. So. We are ready to any kind of negotiations, but we must be open-minded and clearly uh, eyed, um, knowing that it's very difficult to trust Russians. For instance, taking into account also our previous agreements as far as the open sky, because we know that when Russians were using this open sky also over our country and other countries, they were using this to make uh, photos and different, uh, um, let's say, investigations on civilian objects objects what they are now bombing, for instance, while attacking Ukraine. So they have this information, they collect this information, and they would not have any restrictions to do any kind of harm. Um, uh, another example is also as far as uh, cluster ammunition. We know that in some Western countries, this is kind of meant to be a contradictory issue. Uh, from my personal perspective, there is nothing to be contradictory because Russia is using this cluster ammunition. And we know that even if Ukraine possesses that, they will use it much more carefully, not in civilian areas, areas uh, compared to the Russians. So we must be, uh, let's say, clear that um, any place when we give in in such negotiations um, where Russians are very used to such double standards, they might force the Western negotiators quicker in the corners than we think. With that, I will end because I believe my 10 minutes are over, but I will be open to any kind of uh, comments and questions um, uh, what I have been arguing for. Thank you very much. Artis, thank you very, very much. Um, it's tremendous. I mean, I can already see we're going for a really good conversation based on what Marion and uh, Artis have told us when we move to the chat. Um, just to say, we've already had three questions coming in on the chat. So if anybody's got further questions, feel free. I'll try and get to everybody when we come to the chat, having possibly asked a question or two of my own. Our third and final panelist is Paul Ingram. He is the Academic Programme Manager of the Centre for the Study of Existential Risk and a former executive director of the Transatlantic British American Security Information Council from 2007 to 2019. He's had several decades experience leading diverse and multicultural teams to impact decisions on existential threats, particularly nuclear war. Um, he's, uh, he's focused on nuclear deterrence and disarmament issues in the US, Europe, the Middle East and Asia. And since 2019, He's worked closely with the Swedish Foreign Ministry, working out the stepping stones approach to address some of these kinds of questions. Uh, Paul, we very much look forward to your contribution to this panel. Paul Ingram. Great, thank you. I'm going to just share my screen. 
Yeah, as Charles just said, I um, I was involved with the Swedish government uh, in uh, the Stockholm Initiative for Nuclear Disarmament. Uh, the Swedes have been leading that alongside the Germans, uh, both uh, Baltic Sea region states uh, since 2017. And we've been um, trying to explore how we can uh, we can deal with a variety of different stepping stones to drawing the nuclear weapon states into nuclear disarmament. Uh, and uh, the area where the, a number of the member state governments were most interested was nuclear risk reduction. So it's, it's very relevant. Um, as uh, Charles said at the beginning and in our literature, there, there are three um, arenas for nuclear risk reduction that we've identified. The first being around capabilities, uh, and this involves things like uh, the type of weapon system, such that, uh, for example, shorter range um, cruise missile types uh, 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 of weapon are seen to be more um, risky than uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles because they are dual use and it's very difficult to see once they're launched whether they have a nuclear tip on the end. Uh, the uh, forward positioning of nuclear weapons is seen as um, more unstable than uh, further behind because of the decision times and because of the, um, the uh, nuclear release uh, uh, decisions that uh, have in the past, certainly during the Cold War, been delegated to military commanders. Uh, and of course, with the introduction and expansion of artificial intelligence in these systems, uh, it opens up all sorts of questions around command and control, um, as does the, um, the vulnerability to cyber attack uh, and spoofing and all sorts of other dimensions. So nuclear risks emerge as a result of different types of capabilities. They also emerge as a result of intention as publicly declared in military doctrine. Uh, and um, when we talk about risk reduction, we often are referring to the uh, reduced roles for nuclear weapons uh, in um, military doctrine, uh, the declaratory policy and the ambiguity that states have around when they might uh, use nuclear weapons. The signalling, uh, both in peacetime and, and in war, uh, we've seen a lot of signalling from the Kremlin over the last 18 months that has been extremely worrying. And then we have uh, the challenge of escalation control. Uh, so that is as we get closer and closer to the ladders in the escalation that involve nuclear weapons, uh, some of the fire breaks that need to be in place uh, are very important nuclear risk reduction measures. Uh, finally, in terms of the communication and relationships, uh, so this is around the diplomacy, the security structures. Uh, we've had a lot of conversation uh, in the run-up to last week's meeting in Vilnius about security guarantees uh, and the relationships within alliances. Uh, there are a number of technical um, dimensions that can increase uh, risk reduction or um, improve risk reduction that, that involves transparency in reporting, uh, some of the uh, data sharing between uh, the adversaries and mi military to military contact, uh, as well as um, some of the ways in which states have started to talk about the emerging disruptions to existing systems uh, caused by uh, emerging technologies. Um, I'm going to rattle you through a, um, a process that I use quite frequently around um, uh, managing polarities, which I think is directly relevant nu to nuclear risk reduction and, and should help to structure the conversation. Um, so uh, here you've got um, the, at the top, the purpose here of the system is to achieve stability and to avoid strategic war. And the uh, deepest fear at the bottom uh, that we have strategic war and global destruction. And let's just bear in mind that that is a distinct possibility, a probability greater than zero and one that we all have an interest in avoiding. Um, on the left-hand side, we have the first narrative that uh, if we have strong nuclear deterrence, it contains Russia and provides security. And then on the right, we have the second narrative that we need to achieve progress on nuclear arms control and disarmament to avoid catastrophe. These are two narratives that have played strongly within NATO states ever since the establishment of NATO and certainly since the Harmel Doctrine of 1957. <clears throat> 
the uh, NATO strategy has always been to dynamically move between these two narratives, and that seems to uh, to work for member states. If we um, if we burrow down a little bit into some of the uh, strengths and weaknesses of each of these narratives, on the um, on the top, you've got the upsides of deterrence. It contains Russia and it delivers strategic stability uh, and it strengthens cohesion and solidarity. But the downside is, is that nuclear deterrence does deliver an existential risk. And uh, as I say, uh, this, this uh, affects all of us. It, it can drive arms racing. We saw it particularly during the Cold War and we're, we're starting to see a similar thing happen now. And, uh, and there are significant questions that cannot be avoided over the effectiveness of deterrence. Um, if we look on the other side around arms control, we have some upsides there around mitigating uh, the risks uh, the, of the downsides I've just talked about. Uh, and also there is the possibility of building trust and the international institutions that drive these processes. But there are downsides to arms control as well. Um, it, they, the arms control contains uh, NATO's capabilities to prevail in conflict. And uh, there are certainly voices in some NATO states that, that feel that arms control is too much of a hams, hamstringing the capability. And of course, there's the possibility of cheating or rearming in other areas. If we, if we now just take those downsides on both sides and move them off to each side, we can look at some of the warning signs that we can see when we fall too much into one side or the other. So the warning sides, signs of relying too heavily on nuclear deterrence to the exclusion of arms control is that we see great, greater and greater escalatory rhetoric and actions. We have um, more and more limited alternatives for nuclear arm for any particular nuclear armed actor, which is a particular worry in the current con conflict as uh, the Russians um, are uh, more and more entrenched. We have a tendency to believe so heavily in deterrence that punishment itself becomes the objective rather than looking at the outcome. Uh, we can often get it, we can get into a witch hunt of those who question deterrence, even though deterrence is uh, shaky in all sorts of different areas. Uh, and we can see rising defense spending. So any of those warning signs uh, gives us pause for thought and gives us a reason to consider movement. On the other side of this, on the arms control, we have um, a couple of warning signs. We've had quite a significant evidence of cheating on the part of Russia, particularly uh, before the INF Treaty was, um, was, uh, um, came into di disrepute. We also have um, increased Russian confidence and risky threats and challenges. So if we move those warning signs off to each side, we then get what I describe as stepping stones. So these are efforts, if you like, nuclear risk reduction proposals that might start to, uh, to take us out away from those warning signs. So these might include measures that bring greater transparency to doctrine. Uh, the nuclear weapon states before the Ukraine war committed to, um, to public events to explain their nuclear doctrine in front of the international community. Unfortunately, that never happened because of the war. Um, it, we also have proposals to establish a roadmap for pan-European security structures, clearly not possible at this point, but nevertheless, it's still important if we see this as, as a dynamic process uh, where we are challenging uh, the Russians at this point, but we also need to be thinking in the medium to long term about how we draw them back in. We need to be thinking about um, alter complementary alternatives to nuclear deterrence for all sides so that no one side is faced with the choice of complete annihilation or resorting to nuclear um, response. And uh, we need to explore measures that contain the rhetoric and uh, protect the debate around uh, nuclear deterrence. And, um, and we need to highlight the damage done by punishment even when it is justified because uh, in the end, international relations depends upon the construction of positive relationships. Um, if we look at the warning signs on the other side with arms control uh, and over-reliance on arms control, uh, then we need to have strong verification and dispute mechanisms. Uh, clearly, they were not, they were not enough uh, in the past. We need to draw Russia into codes of conduct, regimes and the like, in order to rebuild habits of cooperation. 
and we need to think about all sorts of ways of strengthening the rule of law and global enforcement. Um, I think, uh, in summary, we need to confront Russia where appropriate, but we also need to stovepipe talks on nuclear risk reduction, arms control and disarmament, so that they're not held hostage by, these, uh, by this war. Thank you, Charles. I'd like to thank uh, all three panelists. Thank you very much, Paul, for that. I think you'll all agree we've had three excellent presentations, and now there's a lot to talk about. Uh, we've already had five questions coming in on the chat, and perhaps I can just uh, start to pick one of them first, which I think is the a theme which has run right through what, what we've been asked. Ilmo Ilkla the, from the Helsingen Sanomat newspaper in Finland has said, how probable would the panelists see that a change of power in the Kremlin would ease the tensions in the Baltic Sea region? Or is there perhaps a faction, a faction in Russia that could increase those tensions? And I'll take that question together with a slightly wider question of to, how can we trust Russia? How can we deal with Russia in these circumstances? Marin, I'll ask you to kick off if you would, and then I'll come to Artis and to Paul. Marin. Thank you. Very happy to start on that. Uh, I think I think that's a really good question to ask uh, whether a change of power in the Kremlin would make it more or less likely um, that risks would be controlled or reduced. Um, and I think, unfortunately, we really can't quite tell at the moment um, what a change of power in the Kremlin would look like. So I always caution people from believing that any change of power in Russia is going to be positive uh, for us. Because um, one thing that we shouldn't forget is that Putin has actually been excellent at balancing different factions in Russia over the last several decades. Um, and there are some that are a lot more hardline than he is. Um, we've, for, for those of us who try to watch what's what's going on inside Russia. One of the really concerning things we've seen recently is a very serious, fairly public, fairly high level debate over whether it would benefit Russia to use nuclear weapons during the invasion of Ukraine. Um, and that was, you know, truly concerning for me because um, because there's a nuclear weapon state considering using nuclear weapons, even if it's just a hypothetical and academic debate. Um, it, it is a debate that's taking place, you know, in sort of high level um, magazines and journals in Russia, where very serious people with a significant amount of power and influence are making the argument that nuclear use could be good. So um, we know that so far, Putin has tried to keep those kind of factions in check. But of course, if there was a change in power, there's no guarantee that whoever comes next would be more liberal, more pro-democratic, or more, more in favor of cooperation. So that's what I would say on that point. Um, and um, then to, to answer the question of how to trust Russia, um, that has been a really tricky question for a really long time. And at least for me, I think that the invasion of Ukraine has made that even harder. I think you know, um, Paul mentioned in his remarks towards the end that we need to find a way forward on some of these risk reduction conversations and that uh, they need to continue. And while I really agree in theory, I don't really see how we could do that for the time being. Um, and that's a question that I've tripped up over ever since Russia invaded Ukraine back in February 2022, because I don't really see how you can um, reconcile the existing Russian actions on the ground, you know, seeing the human rights violations, seeing seeing the really atrocious acts that Russia is committing in Ukraine, um, and then sitting down with people who undoubtedly have made some of those decisions and, and given some of those orders to discuss risk reduction. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to hearing what uh, Artis and Paul think on that point, because it's something I've struggled with a lot over the last year and a half. Thank you very much, Marion. Artis, how do you assess this question of changes of power in the uh, in in uh, Russia and the question of to what extent how is it possible to deal with Russia, Artis? Well, first of all, um, we know that any type of negotiations, either between people or between countries, is based on trust. And frequently, once you start any type of negotiations, you are giving uh, at least some kind of a 
trust credit because uh, you cannot verify before except looking back into history. From that perspective, um, I think it would be extremely naive and I would say extremely dangerous for any politician um, to give any type of trust credit to Russia at this moment. That, that would be a grave, gravest mistake. There is no possibility for credit uh, of trust as far as negotiations with Russia, number one. Number two, again, um, yes, uh, we all consider uh, Putin a villain, and this regime is committing crimes, all types of crimes in occupied uh, areas and somewhere else. And that is a moral question, how can we deal and how can we engage with a regime which is basically a criminal regime? We know that there are experiences and, and, and there are possibilities probably to deal with such regimes, including, for instance, uh, North Korea. There are still some kind of negotiations going on. So I do not exclude the possibility to speak with uh, Russia even now when they wage a war, but it doesn't mean that we have to give up uh, on anything in, 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 in such a negotiations, because I believe that there are certain contacts also existing now with, uh, with Moscow. Now, what, what should be a goal of a normal Western society at this stage? Well, the goal should be uh, uh, that Russians are stopping attacking Ukraine and withdrawing its forces from Ukrainian sovereign territory, including Crimea. That is the goal. Anything less from that is actually a compromise which will uh, eventually escalate the Russian aggressiveness. Uh, the change of regime, uh, well, I, I cannot say that any other regime at this moment, even if Putin would be exchanged, and we have no reason to believe that he will be exchanged in, in the nearest time, that could be either more aggressive or less aggressive. Uh, the only um, mark uh, what is important uh, is for us, uh, either Putin himself with his associates or anybody else, if they make internally some regime change, which is not in our, in, in our forces to do this, uh, will they be capable and willing to withdraw from Ukraine? So that only can be the starting point. So uh, until we do not have uh, that um, goal reached, uh, I think it is uh, a very great speculation to speak how would it increase or reduce the risk in the Baltic Sea area. Thank you, Artis. Paul, what are your comments on this discussion? Yeah, so I, I won't spend any time on changing regime because I don't really have anything additional to add. And I would I would I would agree with artists that we are dealing with an organized criminal network here that runs the largest arsenal of nuclear weapons on the planet, which is a very dangerous position. But having said that, we also need to recognize that when we deal with criminals and we put them in prison, we often uh, encourage uh, further uh, deeply damaging behavior. So we have to be very wary of simply punishing. We need to be thinking in the longer term of rehabilitating while in the short term, we need to be confronting and we need to be uh, ensuring that they don't benefit from the situation. Uh, can we trust Russia? Absolutely not. We cannot trust, trust Russia at all, but trust is not something that you can click your fingers and you do it. Uh, it's something that builds up over time. So we need to be thinking about how we build incentives and we need to draw, we need, we need to have the objective of confronting Russia in the immediate term and then reaching out and drawing them into processes where their incentives are very much in line with uh, general pan-European security. Uh, and, um, and I think that means we have to be clear about the verification measures that we use with, our, uh, with any uh, agreements. We need to be clear on the dispute systems uh, in them, and we need to have shared agreement with the Russians that if anybody breaks these agreements, then there are serious uh, uh, reper repercussions for whoever breaks, breaks the rules. And let's, let's also bear in mind that whilst these are organized international criminals, uh, there is also another side of this, uh, which is that the, the Soviets and then the Russians do have a very long experience of arms control, much, not all, of which they have stuck to. So uh, I don't think that the 
record is completely black in this area. Thank you for those three answers. I'm now going to take a couple of questions which have come about the wider context. The first is from Narman Habton from the University of Cambridge and also the Swedish Defence University, where I think he is at the moment. And he asks, to what extent are developments outside of Europe linked to the Baltic Sea region? For example, how impactful are the Iraq war, the bombing of Libya and the US withdrawal from the Iran nuclear deal when it comes to reducing nuclear risks in Northern Europe and the Baltic? And then there's a different question, which is also dealing with outside the region directly from Joe Whitehead, a very interesting question. Can China play a, ro play a positive role in nuclear risk reduction in the Baltics? And if so, what? So I'm going to take you now in reverse order, if I may. So to kick off with you, Paul, on those two questions and see if you've got any insights on that. Yes, yeah, so um, I'm sure that there would be a great deal of opposition to any suggestion of Chinese involvement in negotiating in the Baltic Sea region for pretty much all states in that part of the world. And so I think it probably is a non-starter. On the other hand, we do need to draw China into a responsible global governance role. Uh, we have uh, very little hesitation in thinking that we have rights to engage in uh, conversations and deployments of military capabilities in the South China Seas and areas around China. And they think that if we aren't going to slip into a new Cold War with China, we do need to invite China into these conversations. China clearly has a role within the Ukraine war uh, as a potential negotiator, and we shouldn't be just uh, dis um, dismissing that role as, as particularly pro-Russian, particularly when it comes to putting pressure on Russia not to use nuclear weapons if their backs are really against the wall. Um, when it comes to um, other uh, developments in other parts of the world, um, I think we live in a world, we live in a globalized world and uh, people look at everything that is happening. We've, we've seen a lot of conversation about the lessons that China might be learning from Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, for the Taiwan Straits. Uh, we certainly have um, massive impacts uh, as a result of the Iraq war. Um, and, uh, the, and, and before that as well, the NATO operations uh, in, um, in, the Balt in the Balkans uh, have, have played a significant role in, in uh, reducing any trust that the Russians might have in NATO operations. Uh, and so yeah, all these things uh, are interlinked and, uh, and we do have to be aware that if we are looking to bring Russia into, into line, which we need to, with assertive, assertive action, then we need to stick to those similar regulations ourselves. Thank you. Uh, Artist, what's your perception on these influences from outside the immediate region? Well, China is very important important because um, I think in all our interests would be, of course, if there would be a possibility for China and United States somehow uh, uh, decrease um, the possibility of tensions in Pacific in general. Uh, I am not an advisor exactly how to do this, but uh, what we can see uh, in general, I believe that if China would like to, uh, China would force and could force Russia very much to change its policy in Ukraine. At this time uh, and at this moment, it looks from outside that China is kind of more observing. It has a certain uh, degree of influence, but it's not using its power. It's using power very carefully. Uh, uh, I would also think that possibly at the beginning of this war, of this Russian invasion, uh, Chinese analysts maybe were thinking that uh, that might decrease um, the Western capabilities, that might also split 
of the West, and this was the biggest argument also on the Russian side. Now, I think that China sees also that uh, actually this war was bringing transatlantic unity on a higher level. It was giving much more incentives for Europe to develop also its defense industries, its capabilities. So actually, I think it would be in China's interest at this moment to understand that this war is actually strengthening the West and strengthening the alliance between Europeans and Americans and Europeans and such countries as Japan, South Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. Because if you uh, noticed in Vilnius summit, there were one thing which was at least in our Baltic media was, uh, in my view, under um, um, informed was participation of these four Pacific nations in the summit. So uh, how I would analyze this, I would say that if uh, the tensions would continue to increase in Pacific, then probably the NATO also would become more active with these four nations uh, trying to assist them. And that's probably is not in a Chinese interest. They have been also uh, quite um, let's say, uh, uh, vocally telling that this is uh, not a good idea. So uh, I believe that if China and America could somehow decrease the tensions in Pacific and China would become a more active player uh, in order to decrease uh, the, Russian, uh, the Russian assertiveness and to help bring Russians out of Ukraine, that would be beneficial for the world. So that is one example of outside effects. Another example, I think we look into the history, I think the Russians were observing very carefully the Western and American approaches to different conflicts and Syrian conflict where uh, Obama was declaring the red lines as far as chemical weapons and then were a letting these red lines to cross gave uh, the Russians additional incentive to be more aggressive, just like our Western reactions when uh, Russians started the war with Georgia 2008 and invaded uh, Ukraine in 2014. So uh, anything what the West does uh, outside Europe also is observed by Russians and definitely is very much also observed and analyzed by Chinese. Thank you very much, uh, Artis. Uh, Miriam, what's your take on this conversation? I agree with Artis and Paul on um, on the role of China. And I would also just like to add that while I agree that China probably will not play a role in uh, in the Baltic directly, um, the um, the Arctic is, is another region that a lot of um, Baltic Sea region states are very interested in, you know, notably um, Sweden and Finland, um, as well as Russia itself, of course, and China has also increasingly been active in the Arctic. So if we are thinking about potential risks that might might stem from um, NATO Russian confrontation in the Arctic, then we also need to consider China's role in that. And um, while there is the possibility of China um, being helpful, at least at the moment, that doesn't necessarily look likely if you also look at the um, the types of cooperation that we have seen between China and Russia in the Arctic. Um, because I saw someone mention in the question um, the point around uh, no first use, um, China, of course, is, um, is a nuclear armed state with a no first use policy, and uh, they have often used that no first use policy um, as, as a point to impress on other nuclear weapon states that they might also adopt a similar policy. I think we are quite far from that possibility at the moment um, for all the reasons around strengthening deterrence that Paul mentioned earlier. Um, but I think that there might be an opportunity at some point in the future, very likely after the um, Russian invasion of, of Ukraine has ended, uh, where we might be back in a position where we can talk about declaratory policies, and then no first use might be one of those things that's on the table again. And it would be really interesting to see Chinese leadership on that point. Um, on the question of other things happening around the world and their impact on the Baltic. Um, so I think the the um, Iran deal in particular, of course, has an impact on European security. Um, it is not looking too healthy right now. And if it were to completely fall apart, uh, then the possibility of, of Iran acquiring nuclear weapons would, of course, also negatively impact all of European security, not just the Baltic Sea region. Thank you very much. Three excellent and interesting answers. 
Um, I'm now going to go back from the wider world issues to a question about the immediate circumstances from Sim Amadai, uh, who says, given that Russia will perceive its security to be threatened with the NATO expansions, for example, access to St. Petersburg and Kaliningrad, how does NATO assure Russia that this access will remain secure? And if it can't do this, then what are good de-escalatory steps? Uh, that is to say, obviously, uh, the decisions of uh, Sweden and Finland to join NATO will worry Russia. What can NATO do about that to reduce the uh, threats that arise out of that? Uh, Artis, would you like to uh, kick off on that, please? Uh, with pleasure. You see, I think we have to stop in... Uh... Uh, in our free world or any world um, 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 talking uh, in the narrative which actually plays into hands of uh, Moscow and Kremlin propaganda. Because I uh, definitely would like to decline, totally deny um, a narrative, a wording which tells NATO expansion. You know, it's not like a global warming where we're Pacific or Baltic Sea or Atlantic Ocean is expanding, you know, and taking away some kind of a land. Uh, there is no such thing as NATO expansion. There is a free choice of free nations to choose any type of international organization to join in. And in this case, this is NATO. So uh, if I look from the perspective of Latvia, you know, we had to struggle to get into NATO. It's not like NATO was coming to Riga and telling, could we please expand in your territory and become larger? You know, we were knocking on the NATO door and there have been a lot of politicians, a lot of countries, a lot of people telling, oh, no, we, we kind of don't want you because, you know, that might endanger something. So I think that here it's like a ricochet. It's like a playing a game, um, uh, Kremlin and Russians, first of all, should change their narrative and maybe ask once upon a time themselves, why do their neighbors, including such neighbors like Finland and Sweden, is willing to join a NATO? Why Ukraine is willing to join a NATO? The answer is very simple. If you are not in NATO, if you are not in alliance, if you do not have a solidarity, and if you do not have the umbrella of such countries as, as United States, then simply Russia, sorry for this expression, they simply will invade you, kill you, and rape you. And this is our history. The only guarantee why Latvia at this moment, for instance, or Baltic countries, or even Poland, is not in war or is not invaded in Russia, simply because we were knocking so hard on the door of NATO until they heard and opened this door. So that is the only alternative. And I think that all the journalists, all the experts, and all the analysts should definitely fight this concept of NATO expansion. Please don't take it anymore in your mouth, NATO expansion. Very clear. Thank you very much, uh, Artis. Um, Marion, what do you say about this question? Yeah, thanks. I'm happy to weigh in on this. So what I would say on this point is um, if we look at the concerning actions that we have seen in the Baltic Sea, and I referenced quite a few on the, of them during my remarks, um, they were by and large, all started by Russia. And so, you know, while I, I agree with the person asking the question that the, the history of um, NATO-Russia relations in the 90s is a little more complex than the sort of black and white narrative that we have come to at this point in time, um, at least if we look at, you know, where hostilities have come from since 2004 and increasingly since 2014, it's certainly not Sweden or Finland. And uh, for that reason, you know, I wh while I know that Russia will be very concerned about access to Kaliningrad and access to the St. Petersburg uh, seaport, and also undoubtedly going to be posturing quite aggressively, that's much more of a problem of how Russia um, tries to ensure its security at this point in time and the kind of security narrative that... Um, the Putin government increasingly has been buying into since around 2006, 2007. And, um, you know, while I think 
up until that point, we can probably debate about what kind of mistakes were made in Western governments and how much more we might have been able to go towards Russia or encourage a different kind of relationship. I think from a certain point on, the Russian government definitely made a decision to increase hostility so that it was going to be able to show strength in a certain way. And at that point, we can't really say that it's NATO's fault, I think. So, um, yeah, I would be with artists that uh, we should ask where the risk in the Baltic Sea region really comes from. And specifically with regards to Sweden and Finland, um, who have both been outside of NATO for such a long time and have actually been proudly neutral for such a long time as well. The decision to join NATO was very much the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And um, I think that's a fact that we can't really argue with. Thank you. Uh very much, Marion. Uh, Paul, any comments on this question? Yes, just briefly. Um, I think that uh, it's common practice when negotiating uh, to uh, hold back from starting the negotiation until you're in a strong position and then go in with, uh, with, um, with a strong hand. I think in this case, NATO has a strong hand and there is a, 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 a capability here, therefore, to, to start suggesting things that are beneficial to everybody. When you're, when you're the stronger in any particular relationship and you've got more to lose from, from instability, I think uh, negotiating uh, issues such as rights of pas passage, non-intervention, and the, and the areas that Marion talked about in her talk, um, now is a good time to do it because the Russians are in a weak place and they and they uh, they need to deal um but we do need i think when we do that not to force them into a corner we have an opportunity here this is this is a an opportunity that could be used at this time to lock everybody into rules and uh, and and engagements that are are constructive for everybody thank you very much just to say we've got about a quarter of an hour left if there are more i've got some questions i'm going to come to still which i haven't put to the panelists but if there are further questions from the uh, audience, please feel free to put them in. This question is another one from Noan Habton, uh, which is really what do Finland and Sweden joining NATO bring to the NATO party? He specifically has asked, um, with Finland and S Sweden joining NATO, can they still play a role in global nuclear non-proliferation efforts like they have in the past? Or essentially, does their NATO membership uh, take that particular role they had away from them. But I'll just put it slightly wider than that. Uh, in terms of NATO's stance, uh, what do Finland and Sweden bring to the NATO party even more widely in the military stroke political situation? Paul, would you like to kick off on uh, this question? Sure, I, I'll, I'll tackle this from the disarmament non-proliferation yeah. angle, and perhaps others could tackle it from other angles, but um, Sweden uh, was leading the Stockholm Initiative and Finland uh, very much a leading role. Um, that their, their joining NATO has affected the Stockholm Initiative, which was already European weighted uh, and had a number of NATO members in it. Uh, and there has been a lot of discussion within the international community about the, uh, the balance within the Stockholm Initiative being weighted as a result of this uh, development. Uh, that, that's, it, that's got worse with the loss of two non-European states who held other perspectives. So it is transparently the case that uh, Finland and Sweden joining NATO does affect their ability to hold court like this. Having said that, Finland is chairing uh, the uh, NPT prep come in Vienna in a couple of weeks time. And, um, and I think that Swinland, Sweden and Finland inside NATO does open up uh, a conversation about the role of nuclear weapons uh, within NATO itself. Um, and it's very difficult to know which way it's going to go. I mean, I was in conversation with a diplomat recently who I can't name, um, who was suggesting that uh, there is a very real possibility that Finland may well be asking uh, NATO to station nuclear weapons on Finnish soil, which frankly shocked me. Um, I don't think it's a very positive um, response. And I think that um, I think that uh, Finland and Na uh, Sweden um, can bring some of their historic non-proliferation 
uh, angle into NATO and and to affect that conversation that I was talking about that balances deterrence with arms control. Thank you very much. Marion, any thoughts on the changing role of NATO, uh, of uh, Sweden and uh, Finland within NATO? Yeah, certainly. Um, just to add to what Paul said on disarmament leadership, um, perhaps slightly more optimistically, we obviously have Norway in NATO, which is, uh, you know, big leader when it comes to disarmament diplomacy. And um, while I've not heard what Paul has heard about stationing nuclear weapons um, in Finland, I have heard, you know, diplomats discuss the possibility of a Nordic bloc when it comes to uh, disarmament and non-proliferation leadership. I think that's probably not something that Sweden and Finland, or perhaps Sweden in particular, will want to take on while they are very new members of NATO. But I think in the longer term, that is something that we might see. Um, what I would also say on the point of stationing nuclear weapons elsewhere, I mean, you know, Poland has actually made that request um, as well. But um, as far as I understand, NATO for the time being isn't considering um, further stationing of, of US nuclear weapons on other countries. So um, while that's something to be watched, I don't think that's a huge concern at the moment, um, though it sounds like Paul might, may have more up to date information on that than me. Um, speaking more generally on NATO military capabilities and um, what we're going to gain from Sweden and uh, Finnish membership. So as I mentioned briefly in my in my remarks earlier, Sweden and Finland have a really long history of um, military cooperation. So uh, NATO is gaining two allies who are already used to working with each other and working with NATO very closely. Um, Finland has a very strong army, um, very good army capabilities, very large army as well, um, and has basically focused the entirety of its of its uh, recent military history on homeland defense. So that's um, something that a lot of other NATO member states have not thought too much about in recent years. And I think where um, NATO will certainly be looking to Finland um, for sharing expertise and learning about the the Finnish um, whole of society security concept, which is really unique. Um, Sweden has um, has a very strong navy, is going to really add to Baltic security in that regard, and um, and generally. Um, since 2014 has really focused again on increasing its military capabilities. So again, you know, another state um, that's very used to needing to keep Russia at arm's length and uh, while also engaging with Russia. So I think NATO is gaining really important diplomatic and military capabilities from both new allies. Thank you very much. Uh, Artis, the impact of Swedish and Finnish membership of NATO. Yes, no, on both issues. First, uh, since Finland and Sweden is a NATO country, the Baltic states are, uh, are feeling much safer and they cannot be any more so easily isolated from the rest, as I mentioned. Uh, for instance, in Latvia, we are building now this international Salia region uh, NATO brigade. I believe, and this was also my uh, suggestion and request, that after Sweden and Finland joins NATO, some parts in this brigade also would include uh, Swedish and uh, Finnish uh, troops or capabilities stationed in Latvia. So that would be preferable. For instance, uh, I could speak about Finnish artillery units in Latvia, and I could speak also about, uh, for instance, Swedish uh, uh, Air Force uh, for a while, at least stationed in Latvia, because uh, we in the Baltics, after Vilnius NATO summit, we are turning slowly in, into the from from air policing, NATO air policing, into air defense system. And I think that Swedish uh, Air Force also would be um, uh, very much uh, requested here. As far as the Navy and number of other issues, that simply opens the door for mutual cooperation with countries with which we feel very close. And we already for years collaborate, for instance, with uh, Finland, as far as uh, um, comprehensive or total defense system of our society. So, so Latvia has a similar system. We have been developing it on our own, but we have been learning from Finland. Now, the second thing about uh, international role of Sweden or Finland, uh, especially as far as the disarmament, uh, you see, uh, Russian negotiators are very good negotiators. Never underestimate them. And uh, for instance, uh, even, even such a request 
or uh, public information somewhere in media from Polish side about uh, the necessity to station some nuclear weapons in Poland or in Finland. I think they are very good negotiation chips uh, once there will be a possibility to negotiate something with Russians, because uh, sorry if I'm a little bit of devil's advocate, it's extre extremely difficult to disarm if you have no armament. So there is the need at least for something where you can then afterwards step back uh, and uh, seeing how Russia is uh, simply acting as far as uh, uh, former Königsberg Kaliningrad region, region or, or um, um, uh, tactical nukes in Belarus, well, uh, they must understand that the West and NATO can look into the Russian eyes and tell, look, you know, you go forward, we also can go forward. It doesn't mean it's smart, but uh, let's let's be smart on both sides. So we have also negotiating chips here. Over. Thank you very much. Um, I then got uh, another question from some uh, Amadei who says, so it sounds slightly disappointed. I'm sorry if you are disappointed, Ms. Uh, Mr. Ms. Amadei. Uh, it says, I expected there would be discussion over issues like no first use, no dual use, and not relying on tactical nuclear weapons in NATO. What are the panel's positions on this with re respect to nuclear risk reduction? And also, what about questions of where ABM systems are, as well as nuclear system weapons, strategic and tactical, which could come up in Swin Finland and Sweden? The panel have dealt with a couple of these points. Could I, artists, perhaps ask you to kick off in trying to answer this question before coming to Marion and Paul? Well, my answer probably will be short. Well, any weapons are bad, but even more are those people who are using these weapons because axe by itself is not cutting in your finger or in the leg if you are working in the woods. So the same with nuclear weapons. Uh, I, of course, would be happy as a, as a person, as a human, if we would not have a nuclear weapons on the world. But uh, we don't live in an ideal world. And obviously, uh, such countries uh, as Russia, uh, as some other countries, they might use these nuclear weapons against us. So the only chance is not to say that we will give it up by ourselves unilaterally, but simply to tell that that uh, is a bad idea and there could be a retaliation. So whenever there is an opening, an open window for reduction, for control, for disarmament, of course it's a good thing. But at this moment, we are extremely far, kilometers, miles, away from this, because until Russia is waging a war against Ukraine, which gave up nuclear weapons, which got a, um, a Budapest uh, memorandum and nothing worked for them. So it would be extremely naive, dangerous uh, to think actually on to think on the expense of neighboring nations of Russia, for instance, that such a policies uh, of um, unilateral uh, reduction uh, would benefit anybody. No, we simply would be the ones who would pay against the bill. Thank you very much. Marion, any thoughts? Yeah, sure. I mean, I've definitely spoken on panels um, on nuclear risk reduction where we did discuss issues such as no first use, um, dual use systems and all of that. Um, the reason why I framed my risk reduction remarks in the way as I did today is because in the Baltic Sea region, the only country with nuclear weapons is Russia. So that makes it very difficult to talk about things like no first use or um, dual use systems um, or tactical nuclear weapons if there's just one actor that has access to these weapons. Because, um, you know, as Art has mentioned several times, none of the states in the Baltic Sea region will be in a particularly strong negotiation position with Russia in that regard. Um, if you're wondering about NATO as a whole um, and access to these systems, I mean, you know, the, the two nuclear weapon states in, uh, in NATO that make their nuclear weapons available to the alliance are uh, the UK and the US, and um, neither of them are particularly active in the Baltic Sea at the moment. So for me, it was simply the frame of the discussion um, that meant that I focused on how I saw nuclear risks increasing, increasing in the region, which is through the escalation of, of conventional conflict, which would then involve the whole of NATO potentially. Um, and what I would just repeat again on, on the point about um, uh, nuclear weapons stationed in Finland and Sweden, NATO has issued several statements um, over the course of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, that they, for the time being, aren't considering 
moving uh, nuclear systems to other countries other than where they are already stationed. So um, I don't think we necessarily need to worry about that at the moment. Thank you very much. Uh, Paul. I mute myself. Um, so uh, no first use. Uh, this is a long and tortuous debate within US circles. Um, and uh, I think it's quite f famously the case that uh, President Biden suggested uh, when he was in his presidential campaign that he would consider uh, introducing sole purpose, which is quite close to a no first use, but of course has not done so in his nuclear doctrine. Um, I think I think we have a situation here where there is a great deal of skepticism inside nuclear circles of uh, credibility around no first use declarations. Um, and that harms uh, any uh, capability for adversaries to, to trust and believe in those, in those statements. But I, I'm quite skeptical of that position, frankly, because uh, if, if, a, if, a, if an alliance or a state declares no first use, trains on no first use, uh, tells uh, its uh, military um, commanders and uh, and systems uh, that uh, nuclear weapons would never be used first. It really does affect uh, nuclear posture. So I think I think no first use is a real thing, and I think it is an opportunity for nuclear weapon states to negotiate around um, changing their posture so that they're not on hair trigger alert. And frankly speaking, NATO has no, no serious scenarios where it would consider the use of nuclear weapons first, I don't think. Although that could be changing because there are people within uh, the Department of Defense who are talking about warfighting capabilities, uh, and this is a real problem. Uh, they are attached to an idea of nuclear escalation being the way in which you achieve deterrence. When certainly from a British perspective, nuclear deterrence is something you keep in your back pocket for a very, very, very rainy day. <clears throat> and, 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 that, and that comes to mind for me when it comes also to tactical nuclear weapons, which is another issue raised here. Um, it, it, it's deeply irresponsible for Putin to be uh, deploying uh, tactical nuclear weapons inside Belarus in the middle of a war. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, NATO has been deploying similar systems in five NATO states for ever since uh, the early 1960s. And, uh, and those are seen as threatening. Uh, they are not threatening militarily because they're not actually serious military tools. They are political tools to try to ensure that uh, European states dip their hands in the blood of nuclear deterrence. But as political tools, they, um, they affect the, uh, the ability of NATO to criticize Russia for deploying in Belarus. And I think it's quite in instructive to see that the uh, voices of opposition from NATO are, are, of Putin's latest move were, were quite muted, given that these were new deployments of nuclear weapons in, in very close quarters to NATO states. <clears throat> Fine. We're now about three minutes away from the end. I think it's been a fantastic discussion. I've really appreciated it. I'm going to go through each of our three speakers to give them one more minute, and I'll kick it off with a question from me, which is, this is a, an effort, um, a, an, an experiment to bring together the Baltic geopolitics program at the University of Cambridge and the Centre for Existential Risk. Do you think there is value in continuing these conversations specifically in the Baltic context. So Marin, I'll go to you first, then to Artis, then to Paul, and then we'll wind up. Oh, well, since you invited me, that's a very leading question, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I, I certainly think there's a lot of value in continuing that conversation. I mean, there's there, there are lots of ways that the conversation could go on. I think it would be really interesting to look at um, societal resilience to different catastrophic risks and to different events. Um, I already mentioned resilience a little bit in my remarks, and I think several of the Baltic Sea states have gone a long way to increasing their resilience in a way that, you know, frankly, in the UK, we could really learn from. And, um, and just generally, as I mentioned, uh, right when I kicked off, I think because of uh, the changing security landscape in Europe, we are going to see a lot more attention uh, being paid to the Baltic Sea region. And for that reason as well, I'd say let's keep the conversation going. And I'm looking forward to the in-person event in the autumn. 
Thanks very much and for your own contribution. Artis. Well, first of all, once more, thank you for this invitation. Secondly, uh, even if United Kingdom is not at this moment in European Union, I would say that uh, analysis and discussions uh, on the countries around the Baltic Sea is highly relevant, uh, especially now when Russia is waging war against Ukraine, because uh, I believe that this war actually gave to the Baltic Sea area much more attention uh, as far as our analysis, as far as the large changes in geopolitics because of uh, Sweden and Finland is joining, because, because a lot of things are changing actually in the Baltic Sea area, as we heard um, um, at the very beginning of our um, webinar, of our discussion. And after this war will end, obviously, uh, the Baltic Sea area, which is a Northern Europe, which is a very vital area, which is also very pro-transatlantic, it will play a very important role as far as the rebuilding and reconstruction of Ukraine. And that I would even say that uh, Ukrainian future, Ukraine as a country, will be the extension of the Northern Europe, of the Baltic Sea area, Europe. And from that perspective, I think we have a, a lot of issues to discuss about, about the future of, of this region uh, within the larger continental and transatlantic context. Thank you very much, Artis, and thank you also for a tremendous contribution to our, 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 our seminar. Many thanks. Final word, Paul, to you uh, on this question. Sure. Thank you, Charles. And I would say that uh, this is a very crucial part of the world uh, moving forward um, for all sorts of uh, catastrophic risks, uh, not just uh, but particularly in relation to Russia's relationship with uh, with NATO states but also around climate change, uh, around uh, emerging technologies. Um, I, I'm, I'm convinced that the Baltic region, Baltic Sea region is, is crucial. And um, it, whilst it may be seen as a region rather than a global issue, I think it actually is a global issue. And I think that's why we're involved at CESA. Thank you very much. And thank you again to all our panelists, to uh, the hosts of this at CESA, and to all of the, the audience for coming to join us. I'm really delighted by the uh, quality of the conversation we had. Just to remind you, the recording will be available on our websites in a day or two. And I think uh, I, I really look forward to future events of this time. Thank you, everybody, for participating today. Thank you very much. <laughs>